Live from the Computer History Museum in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering OpenStack Silicon Valley 2016. Brought to you by Mirantis. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Lisa Martin. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for wrap up a day one of OpenStack SV. This is theCUBE, our flagship program at SiliconANGLE Media. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Lisa Martin for today and tomorrow. Lisa, great day today with a lot of great guests. Fantastic day today. Really just incredible buzz on the program today. I think my favorite takeaway today is the number of times John used the word zigzag in context. <laughs> um, really just a <laughs> tremendous amount of um, of collaboration, a lot of innovation, a lot of opportunity, and just overall, uh, the momentum of the day was very, very pro OpenStack. Open it's source. very timely on the zigzag comment, but I, basically we were right on in our intro this morning, and that is, is that the community is at a point of introspection where they're looking at moving past the survive stage to the thrive stage, and I think you can almost feel the energy of the winds shifting the winds of opportunity, mainly monetization, and that is coming around Docker and Kubernetes, really as the big wind, the tailwind for this ecosystem, and certainly is going to change the game on some of the deployments. Um, I would say that not a lot of end users here, but because it's in Silicon Valley, a lot of industry, but it's clear that microservices was the theme of the day, Kubernetes, Docker, applications on top of OpenStack in whatever form are, is, is the key theme. Exactly, and I like that you said that you know thrive versus or survive versus thrive, and I think that was one of the messages that we heard this morning in the keynote was that really um, when OpenStack started six years ago, there was a lot of debate, and for the probably the first few years, is it going to survive? Um, now we're seeing a community that's over 54,000 members with um, supporting partners, over 600, 20 million plus lines of code have been written, and I think that what we heard today across our guests and from uh, sessions was that in order to move forward from OpenStack to harness the momentum that's coming from new technology, they need to be more agnostic, more open to uh, Kubernetes to Docker, and we're seeing some of the ecosystem partners that are really jumping on that bandwagon and driving more of that innovation that OpenStack needs to participate in. Yeah, the thing I was impressed today, Lisa, was that obviously the, the leadership at the OpenStack Foundation, uh, Jonathan's on stage, they have a good pulse of where the market is. These guys at the top and the team of people in the, in the governing body, they understand where, what's happening in the industry, so they're very much aware of the big picture and cloud. And then they have to kind of come into the machinery of the community and get it done. But again, I broke this down into six key areas, I mean five key areas that I was looking at today. Uh, community, operations and consumption of the cloud, production and deployments, business model, and then successes. So each one kind of felt differently. Certainly the community, is doing well, and I think you're going to start to see some breakout winners. Miranda's obviously is one, um, but you're going to see some other companies, I think, come out of that. On the operations consumption side, still stuck in my mind, because the Kubernetes, Docker, is going to enable, and we're going to see how that plays out, but certainly it's looking good, um, and looking much stronger. On the production deployments, I think you're going to see, you know, move from early adopter to production, and then also on the business model side, that's driving a lot of, we heard Rancher Labs here saying that, you know, used to be able to do million dollar deals in the old days, not anymore. So you're seeing that's going to be a challenge on the monetization. And the success cases, not much other than what we heard with NFT. Some talk about IOT and SaaS, but no real signal there. Right, I think at t for a while has been the poster child of OpenStack success, um, you know, they, they tout that as, as one of their really leaders in the space and really helping to, to grow it even more. But some of the burgeoning use cases I'm interested in hearing as we go forward in retail, in financial services, I think that there are, um, there's hopes that it's going to be going in that direction, leveraging some of the models that NFV and telecom is really driving towards. Uh, one of the interesting things that we saw today, well, our first guest from Walmart Labs, most people think of Walmart as a retailer, Walmart Labs being their tech engine, and how they're leveraging OpenStack. They've been very public about that to, um, to really combat challenges with e-commerce 3.0. They wouldn't get into specifics today about the big mm -hmm. Jet.com acquisition, but clearly from what I think the analysts like yourself, John, and others would say is that's a direct hit against Amazon in a direction that they want to go in, and really being fueled by the open source community. 
And I think some of my uh, favorite guests was one was Lisa K. Wood from the Ecosystem Development Open Daylight. Um, and I always joke with Stu Miniman about this. I'm like, Stu, Open Daylight's so boring. Come on, I, you know, it's like, it's not as sexy as some of the other projects. But what's interesting about that in the Linux uh, foundation is a lot of these projects that have kind of been in around for a while are really popping with value and the positioning and the timing of some of these projects like Open Daylight could be a great opportunity for both entrepreneurship and also big companies to take that code and use that software. So that was one of my favorites. Um, the interview with Joe Weinman was spectacular. Um, he was brought a lot of analysts like Mojo to the interview. Also he's, he's written two successful books, one Cloudonomics, which was a couple years ago, and then now one, the digital, um, should I forget the name of it, digital playbook or something like that. Digital they, disciplines? Dis yeah, digital yes. disciplines. Yes. But what he understands is he understands that the realities and the common sense deployments of the cloud and digital transformation was compelling. I thought he brought a lot of insight to that interview. So that was probably my favorite. I've seen him around some of these events. He also does a lot of keynotes. But he, what he talked about the China, Silicon Valley, the dynamic of the global economy, and that if CI, CEOs don't have buy-in to the digital transformation, then nothing's going to happen. Right. And I think that is a fundamental truth at the cloud level and then at the application level. The CEO doesn't get behind it and doesn't understand that this is a new way that will happen. Right. If you don't get out in front of that next wave, you're driftwood, as we always yeah. say. Yeah, and the he cube. talked also along that line about the the need for the collaboration from from the CEO who wants something to happen now um, to the CIO and the team on the CIO office and, and the alignment that's essential. Focusing on what is the problem that we're trying to solve and how do those two get on board to facilitate that transformation. You know, and the thing that Joe points out that I think you know doesn't always get translated in the trenches is it. You know, it's oh yeah, you got to move to the digital transformation. But when you look at how to make it happen, it's always challenging. You mentioned culture a bunch of times right. to the multiple guests, um, but it was Matt, Matthew Lodge, a former VMware guy, that kind of teased it out. And that was a little bit of a, of a nuance for the interview, because I know his background at VMware, he was in the cloud group. And he said something compelling on that. It's the architecture that matters. So even though you might have a dream or hope to go somewhere into the future with digital business, but it's really an architectural thing that has to be decided, and that drives everything. And, and obviously microservices and the cloud were a part of that. So you, know, you, can, you can hope for digital. You can aim for it. You can aim for it right. and hope you get there, but if you don't have the right architecture, you might not, you might not get there. So I thought that was a nice tie-in. And I'll see Alex Friedland at Mirantis, very candid, very colorful on theCUBE. Too bad we couldn't get any more. Uh, um, we tried. <laughs> Spill the beans a little bit. Uh, but overall, great day. Absolutely, I think it was a great day. One of the things that I, I always interests me about technology is that so many companies are technology companies, and it, it's very transcendent. Uh, going back to Lisa K. Wood on the show, she talked about uh, SDN, and how not only is it enabling new revenue streams, and really, you talked about like, showing value for the channel, but one of the use cases she brought up was in K through 12, yeah. and how they're leveraging um, SDN, sexy, maybe not, to actually humanize the yeah. teacher-student experience, and I really thought that was a very transcendent, um, uh, thought that tech companies are really pervasive and having, in, in, in order to really reach that human element. Well, that's, that's a great point. That's a, and that's a great point because what that highlights to me is what we were just talking about. And Joe made a comment, Joe Wyman, oh, the tech guys will go figure it out. The CEOs can't say that. But the, the boring nature of SDN and open daylight, all these things that we call boring, are going to be abstracted away. So once they're abstracted away, they should be enablers for many use cases right. from you know, K through 12 to finance to whatever vertical. So right. to me, I think that's the most uh, compelling thing that you see in this digital is that there's no general purpose anything. The software enablement from the infrastructure to the applications. And that really points to what we've been saying all along, that developers are in charge. I think that's why Martin Casadas Kino, he had a specific slide, the developers are in charge, and it's a buyer-led journey, not a supplier-dictated journey, meaning the vendors aren't in charge anymore. That's actually an interesting dynamic. So if you're in marketing or sales or whatever, if you're going to have an orientation that's you're leading the charge and trying to sell or market or engage somebody, that's not the way the market's reacting. Today, it's a buyer-led 
journey. So I think it really points to Martin Casada's uh, slide was awesome. I think that one slide was probably the most profound thing I saw today. So what are, what are some of the things that you're excited to hear about tomorrow from some of the guests that we have on the show? I'm excited to get Lou Tucker on, who um, we went down and took a photograph. Lou Tucker at Cisco, he was uh, you know, a luminary in the industry. He actually is a living legend because he actually has a product here in the Computer History That's Museum. Right. And Seth and I got a picture with him last night, hopefully get a nice cube cut out of that. So Lou is always going to be good to talk to. He's phenomenal. Um, Looking at the list here. We have Microsoft on the show tomorrow. We have Puppet Labs, Luke's been on before, so Puppet and Chef has been really, the, to me, the pioneers in configuration management. That is essentially the building blocks of what now is being called automation. So I think that's going to be very interesting to get his perspective there. Lou Tucker, uh, James Staten from Microsoft, former analyst. I want, he's a strategy guy at Microsoft. Love to get his chessboard of what's happening with Azure and Microsoft. So, um, yeah, it should be a great day tomorrow. Absolutely, and Rackspace is going to be on as well, so it'll be interesting to hear from them uh, in light of their recent Beat the Street announcement, but also what's looming yeah. over for them in terms of their direction, how that's going to impact the open source community. And of course, we, we did a story on their recent rumor about private equity, taking them private. We'll see if that's any truth to that as well. So, this is theCUBE here live in Silicon Valley, day two wrap up. Uh, OpenStack is stable, it's healthy, it's surviving, and soon to be thriving, seems to be the sentiment. I'm John Ford, Lisa Martin. We'll see you tomorrow for day two, day one and a wrap in the books. Thanks for watching. <laughs>